Coming up on Need to Know, he's the only Republican contender in the fight for Rochester's next mayor. And he calls this election a battle of philosophies. Why Monroe County legislator Tony Michigay believes he's the only candidate who will bring real change to this city. That's next. Also on the show, what's driving hate speech, religious bigotry, and racial violence? And how can communities like Rochester respond? We'll hear about a community effort to bring tolerance to our neighborhoods and our nation. And we'll meet one of the brilliant minds in our local medical community, researching rare diseases to help find treatment and a cure. Stay with us. Need to Know starts right now. Rochester is experiencing a legacy of failed progressive Democratic philosophies. So how would Republican mayoral candidate Tony Michike change that legacy if elected to Rochester's top spot? His campaign is focused on Rochester City Schools, what he calls wasteful and redundant business regulations, and a public safety plan intended to reduce crime and improve police community relations. Candidate in the race for Rochester Mayor and Monroe County Legislator Tony Michike joins us now to make his case. And welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. My pleasure. So Tony, I'll start with the same question that I've asked all the mayoral candidates who have joined me on the show. Why? Why do you want this job, Mayor of Rochester? Well, you know, uh, this is my city, and I view everybody's kids as my kids. And when I see kids standing on a corner, uh, they're throwing their life away. They're involved in criminality because I, I sit on, uh, uh, I'm the chair for public safety for the county ledge. I'm involved with many uh, police officers. I hear the stories. I read the paper. When you hear of four young, young men being shot and killed on uh, Genesee Street, and you find four people in a burned out house and two women get shot. I mean, it's just, it's out of hand. And remember, no one wants to live in this city or invest their capital at the same time, send their kids to the schools if they're not safe. And they're really not safe. When um, our current mayor, who I like lovely very well, she's a nice lady, but our, when our current mayor says that we're at a 30 year low in crime, I can't find one person that believes that throughout the whole city. We have to tell the truth on this. We need to be tough and come down on criminality. And, and one of the ways of doing that would be to put the police precincts back in the neighborhoods. And we'll talk about the issues in just a moment. I want to uh, point to something that you said in the Democrat and Chronicle, or an article rather that I read, uh, and you said the odds are that you probably won't win this race. So what is it that makes you believe while you think the odds may be against you, that you've got a fighting chance. Well, that actually was kind of taken out of uh, context. Okay. I believe I can win. Um, yeah, uh, the odds are always against me when I run because. Why do you uh, say that? Well, because uh, the enrollment. Um, my particular district is like 23 percent Republican, and the city itself is about 11 or 12 percent. So, right. if that's what you mean by the odds, absolutely. However. I've overcome the odds in 2011 and I won. I overcome the odds again in 2015. Democrats voted for me because I bring common sense from a common man. I came from a very poor family. I went through three foster homes. I slept in cars when I was 13. Uh, I went uh, on my own at 14 and paying rent and working a full-time job 40 hours a week at the LDR chart pit. Um, and I put myself through high school. I didn't put my hand out for anybody. I just went out and did it. So that's the kind of guy I am. I'm a can-do guy. For viewers who don't know, Tony is a Republican Monroe County legislator representing the 26th district. So that includes parts of the city of Rochester, Gates, and Greece. And when you first announced to run, you said what Rochester is experiencing is a legacy of failed progressive democratic pop philosophies. You said this is a battle of philosophies. Yes. What did you mean by that? Well, if you look around, you see the worst school district in the whole state number 432 out of 432. 
It's the second worst in the country behind Detroit. You see crime is up. Uh, I love when they say a 30-year low on crime, but murder is up, rapes are up, and robberies are up. That must be the new math they're using because I don't see how that works. Um, I see businesses leaving. I got downsized from General Motors after working there for 25 years. General Motors is a shadow of itself. Kodak went bankrupt. All the new car dealers that used to be on Lake Avenue, they're gone. They, uh, they want to cut a ribbon if somebody hires 10 people. We used to have thousands of people working here, like at Kodak, for example. Xerox used to be here. Now their headquarters is in Connecticut. Something's wrong. And when you talk about the stats <clears throat> for crime, where are you getting those stats? Because Mayor Lovely Warren has held press conferences discussing the, the low in crime. So where are your stats coming from? Um, you see it from the newspapers. You see it from the press. Um, I, I see an FBI statistics. Um, uh, some of it from research, some from the police officers who are actually in the streets that are in the trenches. Um, there's no way of denying when a murder is up 19 percent and you're telling everybody you're at a 30-year uh, low. Of the top 50 cities, murder is up 17 percent. Why would we be any different from the norm? So I want to move on to some of the issues uh, that, and plans that you have rather to combat what you believe uh, has failed in the city of Rochester. Education is a big one. You are the first candidate uh, that I've heard make suggestions um, to adjusting the maintenance of effort law. Now, this is a required law. The city must give $119 million every year, no questions asked, to the Rochester City School District. Under what conditions, if you were elected as mayor, would that money be in jeopardy? Well, maintenance of effort... 119 million uh, goes to the school district and the mayor has no say in how it's spent, where it goes, anything like that. I can't see it. If you have a graduation rate of 45% and of the 45%, only three or 4% can actually do college work, I call that failure. I'm not gonna pay for failure. I'm not gonna pay for services not rendered. You need to get the graduation rate up at least to 65%, and that means you're still losing one-third of our kids. That's not acceptable. Uh, African-American males, I'm told anywhere from 9 to 20% actually make it through graduation. I can't have that. How do I attract business here to bring jobs if we have a workforce that can't do the work, so that don't have the skill sets. So what are you telling the district that they must do to bring change uh, in order for that money not to be in jeopardy? Let me give you an example. I worked at GM. We had 14 levels of hierarchy. Toyota had three. Who was more successful? They are way too top heavy in administration. They need to focus on getting competent teachers out there and working and getting their parents uh, involved in their uh, kids' education. Um, Another thing that I would like to say, you know, um, many Democrats always talk about transparency. How about this for transparency? Instead of hiding the school taxes in the city taxes, how about they collect their own taxes so that people can see the real failure and, and the real cost of our school district? I want to go on to, before you run out of time, uh, you talk about your plan um, in terms of jobs and jobs connected to poverty and, and the work to eliminate poverty uh, through job creation. I know poverty better than, better than anybody out there. and uh, I've been there. Like I said, I slept in cars. I know. Uh, I would go back to um, something uh, that Jack Kemp had, uh, the Enterprise Zones. And taking existing buildings, former, uh, HUD, uh, former secretary, correct, HUD. former existing buildings, bring them up to code, start your business. After a year, if you're hiring people, you're taking my people and putting them to work. I'll refund your permit process cost. Um, I'll keep taxes from you for two years, and then gradually bring you online by the fifth year. I, I, that way, they have the capital to grow their business and hire more people. That's just one example. And then just before we close, if elected, first order of business on day one. I would sell those SUVs that the city has, uh, that the mayor has. I'll drive my own car. Thank you. All right. Well, as viewers know, we've been inviting all the candidates in the 2017 mayoral race to join me at the table. So I appreciate you being here today. My pleasure. A special thank you to Republican mayoral candidate Tony Michike. And the primary election in the race for mayor will take place on Tuesday, September 12th, and the general election will be held on Tuesday, November 7th.
Anti-Semitic incidents are up 86% in the U.S. compared to the same time last year. That's according to the Anti-Defamation League, a civil rights organization. Some of those acts of hatred against American Jews took place right here in Rochester. A public discussion on these events and how to respond to them to create a more tolerant and accepting community is taking place with area leaders and residents. The effort is being led by the Holocaust, Genocide and Human Rights Project out of Monroe Community College. Joining me in the studio for this conversation is Regina Fabro, Endowed Chair in Holocaust, Genocide and Human Rights Studies at MCC. Arnie Sohinke, Executive Director of the Lewis S. Wolk JCC of Greater Rochester. And Daniela Insulaco, President of the Holocaust, Genocide and Human Rights Project Student Group at MCC. Welcome to all of you and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. What's driving religious bigotry in our country? That is one of the main questions that will be posed at the symposium on Monday. What do each of you believe is driving this religious bigotry? And Regina, I'll start with you. Well, I think there's more division going on currently, certainly within the community. Um, and unfortunately, once we have public speakers in the community who are comfortable making statements that allow for an opening into that kind of language, that kind of rhetoric, um, it becomes more commonplace. And so when we hear voices at a national level making comments that um, are driving a wedge, so to speak, between different religious groups. Um, I think we feel more comfortable, perhaps, as communities than taking that approach also. So we're seeing um, some of that happening here in the United States. But I honestly think that um, you've seen anti-Semitism and religious bigotry taking place elsewhere in the world for quite a while now in a way that the United States has not experienced. And so in some sense, I think there is um, a likelihood that we're just now experiencing what, for example, has been much more commonplace in other areas like Europe um, and various countries there. Arnie, Daniela, what either of you like to add on? So, so the, the only piece that I'd add, because I agree exactly with what you said, is I think in today's world, expectations are people from people are things to happen much quicker, they respond much quicker and everything else, and I mm -hmm. think there's less filtering and there's more quicker reaction mm -hmm. than there is in people taking the time to think, is it right, is it wrong, and how should I approach things? And people just react and respond rather than taking that, that time to think. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. Um, if you just, for example, go on Facebook and look at various posts, all of the responses are very reactionary. People don't take the time out to think about what they're typing. They just type away, you know? And like you said, there's just no filter anymore with people, so. In April, we had a special edition of Need mm -hmm. to Know, and it was centered around the 30th anniversary of a WXXI documentary called Safe Haven. Uh, this mm -hmm. told the story of the only U.S. refugee shelter uh, in World War II located in Oswego, New York. Um, this was for former for Holocaust victims, excuse me. One of my guests, Irving Shield, he was 13 years old when mm -hmm. he got to Oswego from Nazi Europe, and he said the lessons of our past in relation to the Holocaust have been ignored by the modern world. And I wanted to know, do you agree? And if so, in what ways could that be affecting what we're seeing play out today? Well, I know f for my, um, my own personal experiences that a lot of people my age who aren't Jewish believe that anti-Semitism is a thing of the past. And that's part of what we do as a project is to try to educate people that it's still prevalent, you know, and it's still going on. So I think that's part of the issue is that people think, oh, the Holocaust is just a thing of the past and they, and they don't try to understand its prevalence in today's society, so. I think there's always a possibility of looking at people from the past and, and instead of seeing the similarities, instead of seeing the overlap, we focus on the differences that exist instead. So mm -hmm. people miss those warning signs that um, really we should be paying attention to. We should be um, much more able to see them um, clearly today. But instead, we look past them. We look at the differences between different groups instead of identifying those differences or those similarities, rather. 
Well, and I think part of what you, what you were asking is, you know, when you look around the world and you see what's happening at different events, whether it's it's in Africa, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Asia, wherever it may be, or, you know, right here in the United States, and even Canada, you know, that um, no one's free from it. And I think part of it is the discussions that we have, what do we take, what are the learning opportunities that we have from what's happened in the past, and that what do we do as communities, as leaders, to take what we've learned and build on that to make something better? And, and so I want to know, how is this religious intolerance of today affecting our young people uh, mm -hmm. and our Jewish community in Rochester? The, the bomb threats at the JCC, for example, how, how do these things tie into this younger demographic uh, that may be different than what their parents or their grandparents experienced? I don't, know, I, I don't know if it's different other than the way the news media handles it and, and what it is. It's probably a big difference. But, um, you know, I'll take the JCC for, for uh, an example. And, and you look at the bomb threats. We had two bomb threats. And in between that, we had the storm here in Rochester, which uh, caused outage of thousands of homes, you know, for a long period of time. And so the first bomb threat was on Sunday. I think Monday or Tuesday was the, the storm mm -hmm. and people without power. Yet we made a decision to build community and say we're opening our doors. It's not about fear. It's not about this. But we welcome everybody from the community to come in and be part of the, the community here. Come in, take a shower, charge your phones, whatever it may be. And, and I think young people saw that because people came in. You know, they, they had no place to go or they didn't have the electricity or power at home. And they were looking for a place to gather. And it became a gathering space. So despite the threat threat uh, of whether you want to call it hate crimes or anti-Semitism is, is that the community bonded together and mm -hmm. it was a positive out of something negative that happened. So I, I, think, I think people saw that and um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll let you go and then I'll, I'll give another example if we have time. Well, I think that um, the social media that, that Daniela spoke about can cut both ways also. Mm -hmm. I think there's the negative aspect of it, but I also think it, dry, it draws people together and makes them um, feel perhaps more um, in touch right. with other groups also in ways that we haven't seen before. So that, um, and that happens here locally, but also internationally. But yeah. I want to hear your second example. Oh, oh, oh go ahead. Okay. Let, me jump, okay. let me jump in real okay, quick, because I want to I get to something. So last spring, uh, anti-Muslim messages were spray painted on a convenience store yes. on university. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I spent some time talking with uh, the owner of that incident, uh, and he explained how uh, this wasn't an isolated one, something that his son experienced in the school environment. The Anti-Defamation League talked about how uh, we are seeing a number of anti-Semitic uh, bullying and, and vandalism increase. It has doubled in K through 12 public schools. So I know I, I mentioned that to say this symposium that is taking place, it is really about religious intolerance, period. Mm -hmm. uh, all religions as well. And I want to know, how do you intend or do you hope that this will enlighten the community, but, but really bring about that transition in terms of more acceptance, more tolerance? Well, our, our foundation, I think, at, the, at, at, at MCC's Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Project is conversation. Right. Once you have conversation about topics, you open up that dialogue. There's more opportunity then for true education to take place. Um, communities don't feel isolated. People feel as though they can actually have a role in changing things in their community. And so the, the speakers we're bringing in for the symposium hopefully will represent a wide variety of different perspectives. Um, we have um, you know, Mayor Warren, who represents the city of Rochester and that position. We have James Kennedy, who is the acting U.S. attorney for the District of Western New York. That also is going to be a, um, a different perspective that's going to be brought in. Hopefully, people will see a variety of different responses that we can have. Well, thank you to my guests for, for this important discussion, and it is one that our viewers can also join. So please save the date. Monday, May 8th, that's when Monroe Community College will hold Anti-Semitism and Religious Intolerance, an educational symposium. That event begins at 7 p.m. It is free and open to the public. To learn more, go to monroecc.edu and click on Upcoming Events on the main page. There are approximately 7,000 rare diseases that affect 30 million Americans. That means one in 10 of us lives with a rare disease. Now, a condition is considered rare if it affects fewer than 200,000 people. The University of Rochester is one institute leading clinical research and therapeutic development of rare diseases. And joining me in the studio is one of the gifted minds involved in that work. She's here to discuss her research and an upcoming event focused on rare diseases sponsored by the U of R. Dr. Erica Augustine, 
Associate Director of the Center for Human Experimental Therapeutics at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Welcome to the show. Thank I you know you've been on Second Opinion before, so it's great to have you with us here. It's good to be here. So what you do sounds incredibly intimidating for people who may not know, and this is incredibly difficult work though, and important work. Uh, what you do has the potential to reach approximately 30 million people. So for viewers unfamiliar with rare diseases, how would you explain it to them, break it down, and when they hear 30 million are affected, that may seem not so rare. So what makes the disease rare? Well, individually, any one disease, just like you mentioned, by definition, yeah. that fewer than 200,000 people is what we call rare. Every country and region has their own definition of what they consider to be a rare disease. And when you start to think about individual diagnoses that fit under that classification rare, there are some familiar names there. Hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophies, many others. And when you take all of those together, that's where you start to get to those big numbers. And those numbers are important because there are a lot of common threads across rare diseases. Most of them are genetic. Okay. Most of these disorders start in childhood. Many of them are neurologic. And the vast majority do not have treatments. So there's really a need to learn from one disease and experience to another. You said the vast majority don't have treatment. I want to share this. Um, of the 7,000 rare diseases, this is according to the National Organization for Rare Diseases, only 5% have treatments. And then fewer than that have cures. Exactly, exactly. We have so much work to do. So talk to me a little bit about, um, I've, I've heard that it can take anywhere between five to seven years for a correct diagnosis. Is that correct? And are any advancements on the horizon to kind of minimize that time? That is what we see, these very long journeys to a diagnosis. And part of that goes to the way we've traditionally uh, made diagnoses in medicine. We really learn based on pattern recognition. And to recognize a pattern, you need to see that pattern over and over. And when it comes to rare diseases, you may see one person with a specific rare disease once in your career. And so if it's not right at the top of your mind, if you haven't seen anyone with this same constellation of symptoms before, it can be really hard to hone in on that diagnosis. But there are changes that are happening. There are increasingly, knowing that there's a genetic basis for these disorders, there's more and more use of what we call whole, whole exome or whole genome sequencing. And that's a strategy that allows us to look at all of the coding information or the instructions contained within our DNA without necessarily knowing precisely what we're looking for to be able to delve into those 7,000 rare disorders and others to try to find a diagnosis. So more and more, I think we're seeing that people are getting to a diagnosis for diseases that we know about mm -hmm. and for diseases that have never been described before through some of these strategies. Well, one that you focus on is Batten disease. So tell me a little bit about who does it affect, what is it, and what are symptoms? So Batten disease, it's actually a set of diseases, and it's, it's a devastating disorder. You know, we see that most Batten diseases affect children, like I was mentioning, that happens with rare disease. And children have symptoms that include blindness, problems with movement, problems with language and speaking, seizures, loss of skills, and all of the Batten diseases, they result in a shortened lifespan. Some of those very early in childhood and some in young adult years, being maybe the 20s or so. And it's just a devastating disorder. And until very recently, until last week actually, we didn't have any treatments for any form of Batten disease. And now we have the first approved treatment for these genetic disorders and for one particular form called CLN2 disease. Just last week, a new therapy was approved by the FDA for CLN2 and two disease. When, and something like, about that. when something like that happens, how does that open the door for other possible drugs or treatments? That's what's so exciting about what we're seeing in rare diseases right now. There's a real interest and a real focus on rare diseases. And that learning from one disease to another we're seeing that. So this particular approval from last week, um, it's what we call an enzyme replacement therapy. So in this form of Batten disease, there's an enzyme that's missing. An enzyme is a thing that um, helps one chemical transform into another. And there's an enzyme that's missing that's critically important for cells. And usually, enzyme replacement therapies, when we give them by an IV, they can't get to the brain. And so this 
uses another strategy. It actually is an infusion that goes directly into the brain. And that is the first time when they've been able to use enzyme replacement therapies for nervous system or central nervous system um, kinds of symptoms or problems. So that opens, that's one way that we've opened the door. We've shown that we can do that. So for all of the other disorders that have these kinds of enzyme deficiencies with nervous system kind of symptoms, we now know that that might be a strategy for those disorders too. So it opens the door for a pathway. And I think the other approvals that we've seen for rare diseases, um, there's a new approval for a, a drug called Ateplersin for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Nusinersen for spinal muscular atrophy. These are huge firsts, but the way in which this treatment happens, the kind of drug that it is, has application for many other rare diseases, and that is just really exciting. Well, next, well, I should say in the 12th, we've got the information about this. Uh, the U of R is bringing together regional and national leaders uh, focused on rare diseases. And explain to me just a little bit about uh, what, how will this uh, symposium not only serve doctors, researchers, uh, but also patients? What can we expect from this? Well, the idea from this really comes out of that long journey to thinking about treatments. So you mentioned the long diagnostic odyssey, that long path. The path to treatment development is just as long. And there are lots of ways in which we can do that better. We can do that faster. And being able to find more effective treatments for patients with rare diseases more quickly means that we can get treatments to those patients even faster. And so we're trying to think about what are the unique challenges that we see for patients who have rare diseases and for clinical research that relates to rare diseases. And distance and disability are huge factors. So people have this long journey to their diagnosis in part because the expertise is concentrated in few centers around the world. And really being able to meet patients where they are is helpful for clinical care, but it also has the potential to be very helpful for clinical research too. We really need feasible, nimble, ways that everyone who wants to can know about research, can participate in research, and benefit from, from the advancements that are happening in medicine. And I think something that, interesting that you said to me, patients will be involved in the symposium. Uh, we've got registration information on the screen available uh, shortly, but I think that's another, you said, key factor is to make sure they're a part of the discussion uh, and the conversation in this work with the symposium. Absolutely. Right, Dr. Erica Augustine, thank you for being here today. The Technology and Rare Neurological Diseases Symposium is being sponsored by the University of Rochester, and that is on Friday, May 12th. And the U of R has an online site where you can find interesting articles and also interviews on rare diseases. To learn more, go to trnds.org. And that wraps up this edition of Need to Know, Rochester's News Magazine. I'm your host, Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for tuning in tonight and throughout the weekend here on WXXI-TV. And thank you to our online viewing audience. Have a good night.